today we are going to have a presentation on ISD Library on the Open Terminology System for Building Smart. Roger Grant uh, is with the Construction Specifications Institute and has focused on the development and delivery of information products and services to support design, construction, and management of the built environment for more than the past 20 years. In his current position, Roger is responsible for management of the technical research and development programs of CSI and is a member of the Building Smart Alliance Board of Directors and Technical Committee. He's also going to be joined by Lars um, Bjorkhaug, uh, who's in Norway and has uh, just joined us, uh, who is a senior scientist with Syntap Building and Infrastructure in Norway, and he's one of the original developers of the IFD Library. He's active in the development and use of ISO standards and in Building Smart Norway. Uh, and before we get started, I just wanted, uh, again, for those who might be joining for the first time, explain this go-to webinar system. You each should have a toolbar on your screen. There is a little um, flyout um, thumb sticky on the side of it, on the left side of it, that has an arrow. And if you press the arrow, it will uh, make your toolbar disappear so you don't have that distraction if you don't want it during the course of the presentation. However, um, one of the defaults of this system is uh, all of the attendees are muted, and that is to reduce noise and distractions during um, these calls and during these presentations with a large number of individuals on them. So there is, in fact, on the um, tool, tool kit toolbar a uh, question and answer tab. Um, we've been doing this at Sea Tech for a year and a half now, and uh, it's actually worked out really well. You can go in and type any question at any time during the presentation, and periodically throughout the presentation, uh, Roger and Lars will uh, pause, and we can get some of your questions answered. I will not say who is asking the question or where the person is from, so your questions are completely anonymous, and no question is too stupid to ask. So. Feel free to use that feature, and of course, um, Roger and Lars will give their contact information at the conclusion of the presentation, uh, so you can contact them directly with follow-on questions, and we will also try to get a copy of this presentation and post it on our website for you to disseminate um, at a later date. So with that, uh, Roger, thank you very much, and if you want to go ahead and get started, and uh, hopefully Lars will join us shortly. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Uh, Lars, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> that was very short. <laughs> well, um, I'm uh, glad that you're here, Lars, and we may also be joined at some point by Jakob Mehus, who works for Standards Norway and is also involved with IFD Library. Uh, he is uh, in Norway as well and um, in traffic, so he may join us or he may not, but Lars and I will soldier on at any rate. Uh, so um, what uh, I want to do with the presentation is sort of go through some background information, and then we'll talk some more about the IFD library itself. I'm starting with some background information about how we, uh, about what we're doing in the, in the United States with uh, dealing with information uh, and dealing with information and how we're trying to organize and what we think IFD can do for, uh, for the problems that we're trying to solve. And uh, then we'll talk some more about the IFD, how it functions, uh, some of the background and the uh, current status. And we'll attempt to address, uh, and I don't know how thoroughly we'll be able to answer it, but I know there's questions with respect to uh, uh, the uh, integration between uh, IFD and uh, ISO 15926 or PISL, so uh, um, Lars can maybe help with that since he's had experience with both, uh, with both developments. Uh, so let me just go through some slides. I'll go through these first slides rather quickly uh, because I think it's probably, uh, you know, not that uh, revolutionary for many of you. Uh, or but it, it gives a good setup, at least from my perspective, of what we're trying to do at CSI uh, with the Construction Specifications Institute to address problems of um, interoperability and information sharing. Uh, so, um, well, um, yes, this is where we are in 2008. We have a lot of uh, disconnected documents that really capture an attempt 
to describe our project. Design elaboration happens in these documents, and they don't always take the form of paper. Maybe we've advanced to a series of files that we store on our computer, and uh, this happens to be my file management system, which I don't think anyone would want, but uh, anyway, you can find things to, to some extent. But the challenge we face in building is that we, uh, we have a lot of information that gets developed at different stages of the project. It comes from uh, different places, and it evolves over time as we evolve the design. And uh, we don't have any great system to uh, maintain, track, reuse that information. And I know this is no revelation, uh, but uh, th it is a challenge that we're, that we're trying to address in uh, the construction side of the industry that may be a challenge. And I think in the process and manufacturing world, it's certainly been addressed better than it, has, than it has to date in the building industry. But one of the challenges we face is the, the fractured nature of our workflow. There's a lot of participants, a lot of applications. And so we're looking for ways to improve on that process using, uh, which was on my front slide, uh, uh, the core uh, technologies of building smart. We're attempting to ally ourselves under the, the building smart banner and the International Alliance for Interoperability to uh, build and develop standards to try to, uh, that are open and that we can share to try and address this problem. So to date, what we've worked with have been formats, which CSIs developed. This is Uniformat. It's a uh, a format for organizing elements in buildings or systems. It uh, addresses the functional parts of a building. Uh, we are in the process of updating this format uh, to align it. There's several versions out there. It does align very well with objects in models, so there's quite a bit of uh, new demand for its use, and we have a task team going right now that's working on this in conjunction with ASTM, GSA, uh, Navy, uh, and uh, uh, other information publishers and uh, uh, government agencies are participating in that process to update that. In order to uh, address information or that's used in early stages of a project, Uniformat is used uh, for the structuring of the information and to organize the, the information that's structured in Uniformat, it's recommended that some sort of a guide, a, a, a guide or a standard for preparing an early project description be used. This is a, a CSI recommended practice for a preliminary project description, which we're also in the process of revising. So the current practice of a format linked with some kind of a practice guideline to give structured information is what uh, we're using and trying to implement, but there's no real consistent or structured implementation of these things. Uh, in the case, it, uh, moving along the project life cycle as a project gets further developed and uh, the information can be organized in more detail, we typically use, in the industry in the U.S., master format, which is a work results organization system, uh, which uh, attempts to identify all the work results that will produce a project. Uh, it has 50 categories of information to structure, classes to structure information, and it uh, has an accompanying guideline for preparing documents to uh, further elaborate on the information that's classified, which is called section format, and we've recently updated this format as well, and so I'm, uh, this is now available uh, for organizing specifications. Uh, that go into a project manual. So I'm going through this quickly just to sort of point you to the things that we're currently doing in practice uh, that allow us to put documents together with some structure, but they don't really uh, let us get at some of the uh, components of information that are inside these documents in any uh, well-organized way. There is in this section format describing a work result, information about products, materials, and properties, which if they were more explicitly uh, identified could be extracted from these documents or placed in them or used to find other information. So 
that's where we're trying to get to, to try to make that information more explicit, better structured, and organized. Okay, so for example, we could do something like have a component in a model that we wanted to generate some supporting documentation for it, and, it, and we could uh, map it out to a, a, a supporting document, and uh, ideally we'd like to be able to go find some information and put it back into the model, but at this point we don't really have any uh, functioning bi-directional information flows that are widely used. There may be some cases of that. I don't want to, you know, say that some of the vendors don't have things working, but the standards to support this are not um, fully there yet. So that's what we're trying to achieve in the work that we're, uh, that we're undertaking as an organization at CSI and in collaboration, as we'll talk in a minute, with these other organizations in, that are involved in the IFT library. So we're really trying to achieve this ability to, we have all these documents that have some structure, they have lots of common information. Um, we'd like to figure out how to both access to it at different levels and uh, get some um, information flow and cross-referencing ability. So the, the current approach to achieve the level of interoperability that we have is using the IFC model, uh, and this is a, a set of uh, object definitions that's developed by the IAI. I don't have their logo on here. I apologize. I should, but this is an International Alliance for Interoperability Development, or uh, which is uh, based on the uh, ISO standard. Uh, talk a little bit more about that, uh, and uh, it's, it's an object model storing geometry, uh, relationships, locations, and properties. Uh, every object is defined by a set of properties, and so what we have developed here in North America is a comprehensive classification sy system that we are uh, advancing to allow us to try to solve that problem or better uh, address the problem of how we can get information from a model out to these different processes that we have and uh, exchange it. And that is uh, uh, a classification system that uh, we've been working on uh, for a number of years now. It's, it's called OmniClass. Uh, it consists of 15 tables. The attempt is to have a comprehensive system of classification, uh, it incorporates within it the elements classification unit format and the work results classification master format, and, uh, uh, and it also has tables of properties, material, and uh, we've, we've put out a, dra a version of this uh, a year ago. We we're in the process of, uh, we have just restarted work on it. We're starting to get a number of applications of projects that want to make use of OmniClass uh, because of the, this attempt to try to s better structure information for interoperability associated with, uh, with building this work here in, in the U.S. at any rate. Uh, so this is uh, I'm kind of going through these things by way of background to talk about what we're doing to currently to structure information, but we've We've uh, been working with uh, the, uh, uh, this International Framework for Dictionary Library System as a way to uh, take the, the uh, concepts or the, the classification types in, uh, in the OmniClass and give them a, uh, uh, and make the relationships that can be made between them. So OmniClass is a faceted classification system that allows you to, to uh, define, uh, classify something by using entries from multiple tables, but there isn't any structure for this. It just presents the tables, and so uh, what we're trying to do is work with the IFC to have a system to give some structure to uh, defining the concepts that will be classified in OmniClass. So, way we're doing that is uh, to work with this IFC's library dictionary. Maybe
maybe I'll pause there for a moment and say that, you know, kind of tried to give a quick overview of the process of using formats that we have been following here in North America to organize information. And now I'm going to try to go further into talking about how we're using IFD library to complement the process of organizing information and improve it and achieve better interoperability and data exchange. Nicole, are there any questions or comments? Lars, do you want to say anything? I've been talking along here. I don't want to keep droning on. You must be doing a very good job because there's no questions right now, Roger. Very good or very bad? Very good, very good. Okay, so, well, I've tried to just set up where we are and what we've been doing. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about IFD library and how it can complement the process for achieving data exchange and interoperability. So the IFD library, in conjunction with some other IAI tools, such as the IFD model and IDM, can give us a set of standards for exchanging information and I guess a good way to, that really struck home to me to describe that, and this may be very familiar to some of the people on this call because of the work you've already undertaken, but I borrowed this slide from EPM technology and, you know, it kind of describes this goal of achieving interoperability through standards through saying that there's three main components of information exchange, terminology, process, and digital storage. And in AEC world, this little triangle up to the right corner there is what we're trying to work on, IFC model, which is based on ISO 16739, the IDM process, the information delivery manual process, which is this structured process for defining an exchange that might need to take place between different steps in the design process or between design and construction or construction and operation. It could, and it's a structured way for writing requirements. And that's, there's actually a, I guess, Lars, there's a, there's a process that's been, I don't know what the status of it is, but through ISO, through TC 59, is there not a new standard now for IDM? I think it's not going to be a new standard as far as I know, but it's going to be a part of the IFC initiative. Okay. So there is some work through TC 59, SC 13 on IDM standardization. Probably I'll talk a little bit more about IDM a little bit later, but it's the process model. And then using IFD library, which is based on ISO 12006 part 3, which also was developed through TC 59, which will come up a little bit later. But this would give us the basis for interoperability, we think, in the building industry. And this is nice. This is supported by work that EPM identified, and they've had some involvement in other industries, and I guess in particular, you know, other people in geotech would be very involved and familiar with oil and gas and the use of different standards there to accomplish the same end goal of having terminology, process, and digital storage be able to be captured and identified through an open standard, a standardized process. Lars, do you want to say anything else on that slide, or shall I keep going? I think you can keep going. I just 
received a little message from Jacob. He seems to be online as well. He's trying to connect now. Okay. Good. So he will join us. But I, I can fill in later. Okay. Um, yeah. Anytime you want to fill in just or jump in, just let me know. We'll just okay, do so. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so we're working on, and what we want to talk about today is the, the dictionary component of this. Library, and so the idea is establishing a controlled vocabulary. Um, uh, being able to deal with languages would be one component of that, and in order to do that, um, you know, we we need to be able to acknowledge that um, things have different meanings in different languages. They might have also different scope and di and use in different countries, uh, even in the same language. Um, Something can have different uh, meanings. Uh, this is a beam here, and uh, um, we don't have a nice picture of a sailboat here, but we could also be on a beam reach, so um, uh, we can at least dream about that uh, at this time of year. Uh, and uh, also, um, it could be uh, multiple concepts. So a pump can be an object, it can be a process, um, it, it can also We have different ways that the same concept might be used, and so we, we can address that challenge with a dictionary. Um, also, um, Lars, I put this slide in because I thought it was helpful to show the idea that within IFD, a, an idea that's an um, object library, it supports ob defining objects, so concepts can have, uh, have relationships associated with them. So your concepts can be much more explicitly defined through the relationships it has with other concepts. And this uh, um, this graphic illustrates how a door uh, could be different things and what it might use. And so, and all those uh, concepts could be then defined to make this when a, the door a door was referred to, the definition of it more explicit. Actually, that uh, that particular door was was uh, used to present uh, a door in uh, in a pistol. That was where it originates from. So you see, it's very it's a very similar way of where you describe something by its relationship to something else. So in that sense, there's very there's a lot of commonality between a pistol and uh, a pistol and uh, The other point that um, about the dictionary is that we also, when we have set up these properties, uh, they can be um, referenced from a, for a variety of uses. And so, you know, maybe this is just basic and sort of what a dictionary is useful for. But this would allow us and to solve uh, the challenges of if we want to identify something and use it in multiple places, but be able to access it. Uh, Common way and uh, not have to re-enter and reuse it. Uh, this uh, capability of defining um, a, an object would uh, support that. The dictionary supports that capability. So, um, Roger. Yes. I'm sorry. Someone would like to know if the IFD strongly is, is strongly tied to the IFD data model. Uh, no. I, I can answer that. No, it's not. Uh, there is um, there is a functionality in the upcoming version of IFD that allows you to to interact with these two models, but they are they are completely separate standards. So so they don't really one does depend on the other, but they are closely linked because a lot of the content from within IFD is actually IF no in IFD is IFD data. So they're not part of the, the, the same standard. Thank you. Functionally, they're not part of the same standard. And uh, yeah, I think IFC 
UX4 release is going to uh, be able to uh, uh, extend the property sets in the IFC model with uh, reference to uh, the identifiers from IFD in very summary terms. Is that right, Lars? Yes, yes that's correct. I mean, there will be a, a possibility to we look upon the IF, IFC as a kind of extension to IFC. It allows you to to uh, have more types and more properties than the the hard coded version of, of IFC. So, so with the uh, with the new version coming, there will be a very like smooth uh, connection between these two standards. Okay, and someone else wants to know, how does the IFD differ from the ISO 13584 parts library? ISO 13584 parts library? Yeah. The period, is that the same? Because um, I'm, I'm, I... <laughs> well, maybe I'll wait and let him... Uh, yes, he says yes, it is the same. <laughs> the same yeah, as the yeah. parts list. Uh, the IFD only talks about types of things. There is no, uh, there is no product, or, or and it doesn't have the in the parts list. There is a lot of uh, what you call parametric descriptions of things, and you will not find that in the in the in IFD. IFD is more um, ontology. It, it has the concept. It has the relationship between the concepts. But if you want to describe the product, you will use either IFC or another standard for that. It just gives you kind of the dictionary or, or the ontology for that that process. Great, thank you. I think okay. the slide is, is intended to sort of make that point that the IFD library establishes um, a concept and its properties, but no, not the instances of that concept. Those, as Lars said, might be found in the IFC model or some other database that use the structure of IFD to organize itself. Hmm. Agree, Lars, anything you want to add yeah. to that point? No, no, that, that's exactly it. Okay. Uh, and yes, I think the, uh, the idea is that, you know, we've, that the uh, IFD will provide an extension to the relatively minimal property sets that are in the IFC model and that in fact, the objects that are defined in the model would be uh, would be entered into IFD uh, so that they could be further extended there. In fact, we have that project underway or in process. Lars, is that correct? Or I think all of all of the property sets from IFD is already part of IFD, and we're also entering the the actual the 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 IFC model itself will, will uh, be entered in, into the IFC library, so it can be mapped to other initiatives like Geometrix. Yeah. Okay, so here's the idea. It's not, and I think this is also a major difference between uh, IFD and Epistle, if I understand this right, that um, IFD uh, is class library, it does not instantiate objects, and where uh, that uh, that is true in Epistle, is that correct, Lars? Uh, yes, yes, that's, um, that's one of the differences, and uh, I think we there might, might be more questions about this later, but I can talk about uh, kind of the connection and, and where the, the whole thing started. Well, we have a slide for that. Let's keep going on to that, okay? Yeah. Okay, okay so um, idea, it's a class library. It doesn't have instances. Um, well, this slide, I was just trying to illustrate that, um, you know, we have established IFD. Uh, we have a, 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 a web services uh, database uh, that are for IFD where can be accessed and uh, 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 concepts can be accessed and uh, um, placed there as well. Uh, we're sort of 
of all is this is in various stages of um, being developed and we'll talk about the status, but this just sort of gives a, a layout that there's the concept that on the right that there is going to be web access to uh, the IFD through the portal. Uh, we have a couple of sites um, up now where you can uh, get information. Uh, they're listed there. They'll also be listed on a, a later slide. Uh, we're also working on some offline tools to enable uh, other software to access the IFD and, and use it. Uh, and we have uh, some input tools that we're working on which would allow terms to be put into IFD, which we're going to look at one example of here uh, on the next slide. So this just lays out the overall topology of how uh, IFD is operated. It's a written in Express and uh, uh, I don't know what else. I guess that's all. I, anything you want to add to that, Lars? No, I guess you could say that the thing called the uh, Web API is a, it's a kind of closed interface to, uh, to the master library. And so it's, uh, uh, it's pretty well defined and easy to program Towards. So the the web tools and the web portals will be using the same API when when they uh, are used to present the content of the library, and there is already a, a few examples of that available. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is an example of an input device that uh, Standards Norway has developed with uh, Holta uh, Holta Big Safe. In uh, Norway, uh, it's uh, known as the property lizer. Um, uh, not to be confused with uh, uh, any other kind of uh, lizers out there, but this is a way to uh, bring terms, uh, to identify terms or concepts and bring them into IFD or determine if they're in uh, IFD uh, in, and uh, Content can be structured based on particular uh, domains or uh, contexts. So uh, this device we're working on um, making available as a way to uh, support projects that are uh, attempting to uh, use concepts from within IFD or to uh, extend, create concepts, uh, um, libraries uh, that would be stored in IFD. have this in uh, uh, there's a uh, draft version of or a, a set version two available now and we're made doing some work here in North America to integrate uh, classification to this so that we are going to attempt to also uh, classify terms in Omniclass as we're uh, bringing them to IFD and uh, we're adding that functionality to this tool so that we can support projects here in North America uh, in, in that way. Uh, and what the result in IFD would be that a, uh, a concept uh, is given a uh, global unique identifier um, and uh, a description and uh, this illustrates shows some of the properties associated with a particular uh, concept if that window uh, identified in IFD library. Okay, and so, um, well, this is what we're, another view of what we're trying to accomplish, uh, which is just to use IFC in conjunction uh, with IFD to elaborate the product models and support uh, all these different applications and the exchange and sharing of information which might be defined in these different processes that uh, could uh, be uh, standardized through uh, information delivery manual IDM uh, process definition. Uh, so this summarizes the o overall goal we're trying to achieve, uh, which I think uh, has been describing 
so far. Uh, so now I'd like to go on and uh, just give us an opportunity to give a little background on how we've gotten here from a development and uh, history standpoint and uh, the organizations that are working together on this. Um, Lars, do you maybe want to uh, summarize the background since you've been involved from the start? And uh, yes, I can try. Maybe from the, I think the, the actual standardization work has been going on for 10 years now. And it, it started off as being a, at least in Norway, it started off as being a, a test of the, at that time, the PIT2 uh, version 3 point something. And, uh, and we did something, a test we called the world test case. And I actually both boast the Epistle library today, or the, the ISO library at uh, CSEC, and I could recognize a lot of the, the objects we added at that time. So, um, but there were several initiatives going on at the same time. So, one of them was the lexicon uh, initiative. And, uh, well, to, to make a long story short, the, the conclusion from the test was that it was a very interesting uh, initiative but we wanted to have something more simple to start with. And uh, so we decided to try to take a subset of the Epistle model and, and uh, prepare that for the building industry because we wanted this to be closely connected to the IFC and to not have an overlap of the, the goal there. We wanted to take off that bit that had to do with the instances because that was dealt with the actual buildings were in the IFC. I see model and we wanted to deal with only the, the concept and the more generic description of them. But through the standardization work we we did some modification and so there are there are some differences between uh, the Epistle and, and uh, IFC, which I can describe, but maybe if you can go through your presentation first and we can hear some questions. Well we are from operating the IFC at this point is that um, in 2006 we formed IFC Library Partners between uh, Building Smarts in Norway, the Sabu Foundation in the Netherlands who has developed Barbie and Lexicon uh, to date, and uh, CSI in the U.S. and the Construction Specification in Canada in Canada, and we're working to continue the work we're, we're collaborating to continue the work that was started uh, by the Norwegians and the Dutch uh, and to try to make the IFC library a self-sustaining enterprise so that when we put all this uh, content in there, we can uh, 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 ensure that it's going to be available and, and uh, taken care of. Uh, we've applied for and received uh, uh, recognition under IAI International to be a group so the IFC library is now a group under IAI International. We report to the uh, International uh, Council uh, and uh, uh, have a charter that uh, we can make available to anybody that's interested that describes the structure of the organization. And the idea is that uh, we will uh, have different classes of involvement, uh, partners, um, uh, affiliates and observers, anyone that's project trying to use IFC, we'd ask to join as an affiliate, and the observers uh, can continue to stay involved in what we're doing, and potentially uh, we'll expand the partner group as we get a few more things established and figure out how this all might work. So that's how we're operating IFC. Um, I think 
have the actual property lines or we built the marine content into the IFD as one method anyway. Um, and uh, we were also, uh, as part of that development, have uh, uh, our, have a .NET toolkit that we're uh, actively bringing out that would support the development of other um, applications that wanted to into the uh, IFD, and we're starting. We're doing pilot projects, uh, not only in North America. I put North America on the slide, but also in Norway and uh, the Netherlands. Um, we're doing projects that are starting to use IFD content. Uh, I could really just summarize in the U.S. Uh, a lot of what we're doing um, is with uh, OmniClass in support of the development of the National Building Information with the International Code Council on some smart codes projects and currently working on the Energy Code. Uh, we're doing a couple projects that are looking at trying to set up product uh, property libraries for products. Um, we have some work of our own just to put terminology in, uh, into the system and we have a couple of projects in the general services administration in their BIM guide series that sort of a summary of the projects that we have. Uh, this is uh, in the case of the uh, um, of the National Building Information Model Standard where they're trying to establish uh, these information exchanges and um, identify who, why, when, what, with whom. The goal is to use OmniClass as specification for all of that information. And I
this is just um, focused on synchroni synchronizing with IFCs, or if it also um, is looking at synchronizing with ISO 15926 or harmonizing. Uh, should I try to answer that? Or? Oh, I got Lars, yeah. Yeah, um, at least in Norway, we, we tried to to get up running a project to to harmonize the two initiatives because they are they are very similar, but on the other hand, they also have their differences. So uh, what we tried then was to, to to harmonize it through a more generic ontology uh, initiative. And, um, but unfortunately, we didn't get the, the funding to do that work uh, when we tried. But uh, when, when you when you look upon the content, I think the uh, there is a there is a certain overlap. But on the other hand, there is a in the the uh, the process initiative that I know pretty well worked a lot for the oil and gas and uh, and. Um, why we've been working more with the building, and to start with the, the things that in, uh, is already in the IFC and then expand it. But I think uh, it would be a very good idea to try to get some kind of cooperation between this. But the the idea of harmonizing uh, the word harmonizing can mean many things. Uh, I would rather say try to map the two initiatives together than try to harmonize because. Uh, one of the, the reasons why IFB became what it is was the, the fact that we were we were witnessing the attempt to harmonize the two uh, original initiatives of the assist the, the Dutch and the Norwegian one. And if harmonize means to take two things and make one, then that's a very hard and, uh, uh, and I would say nearly impossible task. But if you try to look at similarities and, and connect them and map them, then I think we should uh, really try to do that. Actually, um, uh, one of the gentlemen here has pointed out, too, if, Roger, could you go back to the earlier slide where you had um, the various initiatives and organizations and maybe just provide a little more explanation on what you're doing with each of these groups to integrate or map? This slide, um, Um, the one that had the initiatives and standards, yeah. This one? Yeah. This slide? Uh. Or the one that had the... Well, I thought there was a slide earlier, and I've been monitoring the Q&A, so I didn't see all the slides. But I thought there was one where you had listed the different initiatives and standards, and the thought was just that you could go through them, but um, there's been quite a few other questions as well, so while you're um, looking at those, uh, one person wants to know is, is the IFC a single library internationally, or is it only constructed for each country or group of uh, companies? It's one single library. It's a, it's a master library, but you can, the idea is to have the possibility to have have local versions, but when you add content, you, you have to add it through the master library and then sync it out to all the, the local versions. But um, it is, it can, uh, the, the ISC has two things uh, that it, it added in a way when we're, that are that different a bit from, uh, from the FKC standard. One is that we designed the the thing with the having multiple link, uh, languages was one of the initial uh, design criteria. So we made that m much more explicit than it is. I know it's fully possible in the FISC to have many languages, but in IFB that was made a separate, a whole separate kind of model uh, in order to to achieve that. And then we have, rather than having, rather than having one library with one specialization structure or we, we allowed in IFC to have multiple. We, we said it, IFC should be a, a kind of an uh, attempt to map all the existing classification standards and other standards within one library. 
and that's why it, the, the model itself is very, very small compared to the, the uh, physical model. And, uh, and it doesn't say anything about what, where, where this is specialized quite far down. The, the, the IFC model actually only have nine main entities, and then the specialization and everything takes part with the population of the library. And you can have many different uh, trees within the same library. So Omniclass can be there exactly as it is. And we can have another, the region center exactly as it is. And what IP eventually does is that it maps and it shows what's common within these uh, standards. Okay. Um, I, I think I just, one of the questions, and I, I guess just for some further clarification, Theatech is working with Building Smart and particularly Jeff Wicks, who I think is the representative in Europe, um, to bridge, let's say, um, these initiatives. Um, and another, another uh, I think, um, workshop that is going to be taking place, Roger, at CSI, we're going to have Theatech representatives. Uh, Rick Jackson will be there and Robin Benjamin, who leads our ISO 15926. But one of the leaders of our ISO 15926 initiative will be attending the workshop so that we can ensure that there is um, not a duplic duplication in efforts. Um, I, I, another question that just came through actually was how does the oil and gas sectors differ from the building construction with respect to digital information exchange? And I, I think that's that's sort of the money question, whereas we, we, we have these different initiatives looking at different sectors, but it, it's really the same problem um, requiring a similar methodology with perhaps different objects. Um, but we also have oil and gas and just companies in, 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 in industry that, that are building buildings as well. So having, I think, more of a global uh, solution is, is one of the reasons why we wanted you to come and talk to us so that we could learn more about this and, and figure out how we can do this uh, the smartest way possible. But, uh, yeah, I think that's a great question, and I do know that uh, Jeff Wicks has been very involved in this project as well. He's worked with us. He works with uh, Standards Norway and uh, Building Smart Norway uh, on work they're doing, and uh, I, do I did hear that there's someone in, uh, uh, I think in II, who's trying to look at this uh, this the, the differences and try to come with some kind of uh, uh, summarization. Uh, someone in the UK, not Jeff, but Jeff's probably involved. Uh, and will they be attending the, the workshop in April? Well, Jeff will be at the workshop in April, and uh, you know we have uh, people from Standard Norway uh, coming. Several uh, software companies from government agencies, uh, from Theatech, from Oscar, from the uh, different parts of Building Smart Alliance uh, in the U.S., uh, and uh, uh, Jeff Wicks, people that are involved in this ICC Smart Codes project. And so we're trying to keep advancing this idea of how do we put these standards together so they can interoperate. I tried to invite Mark Palmer uh, from NIST, who I think works with Theatech on, a, on the ISO uh, 1596 projects, and he's not able to make it, but he wants to send someone who's working with him. So, um, yeah, so we also we we do have the head of the um, our ISO project coming too. So, um, Mark's been working on another project uh, more closely, but for us anyway. But um, that, that's great. That's um, good to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I well, don't know who the other person was, but he said he worked on on the dictionary project for for him or with him or something. Interesting. Uh, one more comment, kind of question is. Um, you may want to take a look at the balloting document ISO IEC. Guide 77 of um, TMB titled Guide for Specifications of Product Properties and Classes. This provides guidelines for building the structure of library and how to define property value sets for products. So um, 
we will. We will take that under advisement, and we will be having this workshop. We wanted to let people know that um, I think, Roger, will you be able to give us a copy of this presentation that we can send to the attendees? Yeah, I can. We've had a few requests for copies. Yeah. Okay, great. So those of you who have emailed and asked, um, we will send that out. And uh, it looks like we've hit our, our noon lunch hour. And uh, I wanted to thank Roger, Lars, and Jakob um, for giving us uh, this presentation and informing us and keeping us uh, alert and aware of um, all the different initiatives that are out there, and uh, I wanted to just assure those in Theatech that we will continue this um, with the workshop in April. Um, it'll be discussed at the conference in New Orleans, and uh, of course, you can follow up with Roger and Lars and Jakob directly with their contact information on that last slide. So, thank you very much. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Roger, or Lars, or Jakob? I don't think so. I think, you know, if anyone is really interested uh, coming to that workshop, it's still a, it's a possibility. If you send me an email, I can send you the information about it. Uh, and certainly we'd be happy to correspond with anyone. Uh, and, yes, there are, we are aware that there can, these things have a lot of parallels, and we're trying to do what we can to, uh, to bring them together uh, and, you know, not waste resources. And that was a very good reason for having this webinar. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, everyone. I've just got a bunch more emails. We will get the, we will get a copy out to all of you today. And um, thanks, thanks all of you, and thanks for um, those of the, you two in Norway for um, getting up so late in the day. And we'll talk soon. No okay. Thanks, thanks.